dark, cold world out there. There's a time to live and a time for a man to die. There are places for dead men in the earth and the sky. Don't you venture too far now, cause you can't come back from the place where Hello everybody and welcome back, back to a new episode of Ring Respect Radio right here on the Video Bros Network. I am Bobby Munson and I'm joined as always by the man with the angelic voice. You know him best as Papa Smokes. How you doing, sir? Yeah, I'm doing great, Munson. And how are all my wrestling people doing out there? Hope as always that everybody's doing well, staying healthy and being kind to one another. Unless you're in the middle of a ring, feel free to punch your opponent right in the damn face. But we're here talking about all things pro wrestling on the Video Bros Network on Ring Respect Radio. And we're going to be covering three episodes of MLW Fusion Alpha here today. So a nice big action-packed episode for you all out there. But before we go ahead and do that, we're going to ask you to click the subscribe button down below. Turn on the notification bell so you know anytime we release new episodes of Ring Respect radio right here on the video bros network what that does for us it takes a second for you to subscribe and it helps us get boosted up in the rankings so more people can discover this show and help support local podcasts and local pro wrestling also while you're at it go and check out our good friends at backbreaker media big shout out to mike the ref for all of his hard work and what he's done to support ring respect radio and also to be part of the solution pop smokes we're wearing the shirts here tonight as we record thank you mike the ref for sending those our way uh, i think these look pretty damn good on the video bros how about you pretty nice shirts yeah thanks going out to mike the ref and, and to everyone out there be part of the solution don't be part of the problem exactly so on from there, we're going to step right into it because we had a lot to unfold and a lot to talk about here, Papa Smokes. We're going to start with MLW Fusion on Thanksgiving that happened uh, almost three weeks ago at this point. It's been a while since we gotten together. But uh, we're going to talk about this particular episode, one that I, I think I have to say one of the best ones from start to finish for me. This was a fun, action-packed episode of MLW Fusion. It took place on Thanksgiving in the United States. So as you know, here in Canada... We celebrate uh, Thanksgiving in October. Our friends to the south, they celebrate it in November. So this episode aired on YouTube on Thanksgiving. And we started right off with a big one. It was a semifinals match in the Opera Cup when TJP took on Calvin Tankman. And uh, as we'll talk about the match itself in a little bit. But one of the more interesting parts of this whole thing, Papa Smokes, Alex Kane not only coming out to ringside, but no longer part of America's top team anymore. King Mo not at his side, but a new partner in crime. Alex Kane and company, uh, whoever this guy's name is, a physically threatening looking individual there at Alex Kane's side. Um, lots to unfold here. What did you think, Alex Kane and his new partner in crime there? Yeah, the, to be honest, I didn't catch his name either, Munson, but uh, a huge guy. And I think it's good for Alex Kane to have a little uh, sidekick by him while he gets this uh, push towards uh, possibly winning the open weight uh, championship. This is good, but we do need a name for this guy. MLW, if you're listening, this guy needs a name. Well, until then, and we'll explain the reason for this uh, later on in the episode, but hey, Alex Kane and company, boom I. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to the match itself, though, TJP, Calvin Tangman in the semifinals of the Opera Cup. This one started off a little bit on the slower side, but that is okay with me. It was okay getting a feel for each other. Uh, these are two very contrasting different styles between Calvin Tangman and TJP. But, man, this start, what started off slow definitely had its way of picking itself up throughout the match. Obviously, TJP generates a lot of heat in his matchups and backstage. The fans absolutely loathe this guy. But man, does he play it well. And this match uh, showed a lot of his great skill. I think that TJP was uh, on great display in this one here. And might have been even one of Tankman's uh, better matches at the same time too. This one lasted a little bit longer than your typical Alex Tankman match. Um, I like this Pop Smokes. I thought this was strong. It was really good. TJP picked up the win after interference from Alex Kane and company, uh, which happened twice. The first interference on the outside of the ring there when they uh, Kane got a hold of Tankman for the uh, German suplex and his partner in crime there added the 
clothesline to it. But the second time, here's the part that I found a little bit funny, was that the ref stayed a little too overly distracted for two guys entering the ring and uh, getting involved. Aside from that, to me, that's absolutely split in hairs because the rest of the match was solid. Great win. TJP going to be taking on Davey Richards in the finals of the Opera Cup. Pop Smokes, throwing it over to you. What did you think? Yeah, I also like this match. Like you said, it was a clash of styles. Really interesting, the, the kind of uh, power of Tankman versus the speed and finesse of uh, TJ Perkins. Um, this was a nicely paced match. I, I thought it was interesting that TJP started quite slow too, considering that his opponent was a much bigger and heavier man in Tankman. Uh, but TJP had a plan in this, and he was wearing him down uh, with... He used strikes, uh, holds, and rule breaking to build up heat on Tankman throughout this match, and it was really nice. Uh, I liked the one transition TJP made from a fireman's carry. Uh, uh, Tankman had him in the fireman's carry, and uh, TJP got the octopus submission hold on him from the standing position. Nice, nice touch. like that a lot. And, uh, yeah, we had just, again, a little bit of shenanigans towards the end with... Uh, the turnbuckle pad coming off with the exposed turnbuckle underneath. Uh, Tankman's head goes into it. TJP hits the frog splash. Pinfall. And then I liked his nice touch of doing the suicide gun motion to his head afterwards. As we all know, uh, TJ Perkins was the guy who played suicide in in uh, TNA uh, more than 10 years ago. It had quite a nice push there going. I, I never knew that that suicide was TJP until the past couple years. Very interesting, but I like this, and I'm just loving TJP's work right now. Not everyone's loving uh, TJ Perkins, the guy right now. That To me, that's, that's outside the point completely. I'm just loving his ring work. The guy's slick and smooth and uh, puts on a great match every time. All opinions aside, he is embracing the heat like nobody in the business right now, aside from maybe Austin Aries, <laughs> who takes it on the uh, chin quite well too. But uh, TJP followed this up with an, uh, a little bit of a promo at the top of the ramp with Alicia too. I like how they're doing that. Interviews afterwards as the guys are heading to the back. It's a nice touch, especially in the... Uh, opera cup that they've been running this for and alicia too asking tjp if he was ashamed of what he had just done and just that that smirk that's on his face that slappable smirk when he's like ashamed ashamed of all the hard work and accomplishments i did on my own are you kidding me right now I, uh, it was just the icing on the cake i thought this was brilliant this guy's promos are great and they're great in a sense that He's embracing the heat. No matter what side of the fence you sit on, opinion-wise, you can't help but think that TJP knows how to talk. He understands what is pissing people off out there. And he's embracing it and using that heat to be one of the only true heels in professional wrestling today. And I think that's what it takes to be a true heel in wrestling is to blend the real with the performance kind of end up. And uh, to take real issues that people have strong feelings about and bring it into wrestling. It's, it's a slippery slope sometimes, but I think what TJP's doing is a good thing. It's keeping him relevant and, and his name in people's mouths. And uh, he's, he's become uh, one of the top heels in MLW and in all of wrestling, I think. Yeah, and quite interesting too. Again, they mentioned about Alex, uh, Alex Kane being an alternate in this MLW Opera Cup. Um at this point, you start to wonder, was he ever going to get an opportunity to be in there after all? We now have the final set in place, TJP and Davey Richards. I couldn't imagine that there was any reason for Alex Kane to go further with this and try to take a Richards or somebody out of this thing. Uh, so, again, a bit of a swerve from MLW, but a swerve that I liked because I was calling the whole time thinking, there's somebody that Kane's going to take out. They teased us with it, teased us with it, never pulled the trigger. And i got to say, kudos MLW for that kind of booking. Yeah, they got one over on all the fans who think they know everything when there's a suggestion of something. Well, sometimes it's a red herring and it's it's just a clue that you're not that is false that you're not supposed to follow. So, well done by the booking team there. I don't mind being left out in the cold and behind closed doors when uh, the good uh, meetings are happening to make sure that they throw a swerve my way. And speaking of doors 
and Open Doors in particular. We go on from there to find out that MLW has initiated an Open Door policy. The Open Door policy is going to be for all free agents in professional wrestling. So this means, again, the abundance of recent recent releases that are going to be coming up to their, after their 90-day release clause from the WWE. We're talking about the talents that no longer are going to have a position with another company from Ring of Honor. And just in general, talents from around the world that are now going to have a free door to come into MLW. One-off dream type matches or even if there's a reason for a good feud to take place, their door is open for them to walk into the doors of MLW and get in an MLW ring. And already... Somebody has taken the opportunity. Hoho Loon is coming to MLW, I believe, in January, they mentioned. Uh, he is the founder of Hong Kong Professional Wrestling. Uh, Hoho Loon, I believe, also had a short stint with the WWE uh, in NXT and I believe was part of the cruiserweight division, if I'm not mistaken, as well, too. Uh, he was very new and green at the time, but I know that he's uh, worked very hard and gone a long way. And I'm very interested to see this appearance from him in an MLW ring to see how it all unfolds. Yeah, me too. And just like we always say, we appreciate MLW for uh, recruiting beyond just the borders of America kind of thing to get some international stars, to get a guy from Hong Kong, to get luchadors from Mexico, to, to get Japanese guys, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's nice. It's fun. And it's great for the viewer to see some guys who are not just trained in the same systems all the time. Yeah, you got that right. Uh, next up, we go to a backstage segment where backstage we go to Alicia Two and Warhorse. And Warhorse is holding a plaque pop smokes. He's been awarded the Best Person from Parts Unknown Award, I believe, from, if it's not mistaken, Pro Wrestling Illustrated gave him this. Yeah, yeah. There, there we go. But uh, he points out that his name was spelled incorrectly on the plaque. And even though Alicia Two points out that it's W-A-R-H-O-R-S-E, he goes, incorrect. That's not how you spell it. It's all capitalized. All capitalized. Like, Warhorse! Warhorse! <laughs> I love this part. I yeah. love this. It was fun. This is what I like about Warhorse, the addicting portion of him. He's a little over the top. He's funny. But he also knows his place. He's not the guy that's expecting to be pushed into the main event picture right now. He's out there to have some fun and kick some ass. Uh, and speaking of kicking ass, that's when Casey Navarro comes into the picture. And uh, these two have a little bit of a spat with each other and the fight ensues. I, I am totally on board with Casey Navarro and Warhorse. I think this one is more equally matched up in the terms of their style, size-wise as well, too. I think that... This would actually be a great uh, opportunity for Casey Navarro to step in the ring with somebody like Warhorse. Yeah, and vice versa, I think, too. This is, uh, I like the way they're doing, uh, setting up an angle and a nice little feud for the for the lower area of the card from the middle or, or lower middle area where the, these matches would occur. This is nice. And, and to, to call some of these uh, indie guys in here to, to do jobs all the time is one thing, but let, let them have a little fun. Let them have a little angle and a little feud and a dance partner that they can work with for a while and turn out some good matches. It's a good strategy, and uh, I'm hoping to see some of our other favorites get a little action like that, such as a Zenshi or somebody who might just get to have a little feud and have some meaningful matches in, instead of uh, jobs all the time. So speaking of guys who have been kind of called up out of nowhere, Papa Spokes, uh, Emilio Sparks, of all people, who's kind of reared his head into uh, MLW over the last little while, is backstage and confronting Calvin Tankman about his loss earlier in the night and what uh, went down with Alex Kane. Um, after this is when Tankman grabs Emilio Sparks by the throat, presses him up against the wall, and I say has got to deli have delivered the best, by far best, promo that I have heard come from Calvin Tankman yet to date. This one came across the most real, the most serious, when he starts saying things along the lines of, I'm one of the best in this fucking locker room and I need to prove it, uh, that he screwed up his title opportunity, but since then he's been building himself back up. All of this was gold. Uh, Myron Reed coming in, to, coming in to calm Tankman down and everything like this plays back into their friendship that started earlier in the year. Everything about this promo and this segment in particular worked because it felt like it was real. Yeah, and I, I think Tankman comes across as real. I really like uh, most of his promos, particularly a one like this where he's really worked up and you could see that yeah, Alex Kane has, has gotten into his head and it's driving him crazy and it's driving him to rage. 
and he's letting that out. He's letting that rage flow through his body and spewing it out into his promo. It sounds great. And, and he, his appearance and with his grill in and stuff, he looks like a very intimidating guy. And uh, his, his promos come across great, I think. And uh, I like this a lot. Yeah, kudos Tankman. Great job. Uh, speaking of promos, up next we had another one. This one from our boys, the Vaughn Ericks there. We haven't seen the Vaughn Ericks for quite some time, so I was glad to see him back on screen. They're ready to get back in and start kicking some ass. I mean, it's been a long time since we've seen them. Uh, probably uh, haven't even seen them since MLW's made the return here, other than it maybe in the battle ride. I can't quite remember if they were in that match or not. But nonetheless, they want a shot. They want a chance at the opportunity. They're saying 5150 is trying to cut the line. They want that tag match. And they're putting down the opportunity to Cesar Duran. Book the Vaughn Ericks for the first time in 40 years a title match in Dallas, Texas. This is huge, Pop Smokes, and you can shed even more light, I'm sure, on the history of the Vaughn Ericks in Dallas, Texas. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're the most famous wrestling family in, in Texas history, except for the Funks, I suppose. Uh, the Vaughn Ericks ruled Dallas in the in the 80s, but packing that sportatorium till that building couldn't fit them anymore, and they had to go to Texas Stadium. And uh, we all know of the famous huge match where... Uh, the Von Ericks as a three-man tag team uh, fought the Freebirds as a three-man as the blow-off match for their huge feud. And then in the main event, Kerry Von Erich won the NWA title from Ric Flair. Like, that's one of the big wrestling moments of that entire decade. And uh, the Von Ericks are, are just wrestling gods in, in, in Texas and uh, particularly Dallas. So how fitting it is, they've got to, they've got to make a big return there. We know that uh, Ross has been injured and had his surgery and stuff like that. Or, pardon me, Marshall was injured and had surgery. Ross was off training in Japan under in a dojo somewhere, and so he was learning some new holds and stuff. I'm very much looking forward to this return, and this promo really got me fired up too. And as good as Ross is, I, I gotta love Marshall. Boy, he gets yelling, and he's very uh, convincing. Also, you can tell it's. You can tell when a guy's saying it from the heart, and you, you don't hear that very often in promos anymore. It used to be more common, but Marshall's got the hang of it. He's in there yelling and and saying some rough words towards his opponents, and this uh, strikes a chord with the viewer for sure, and it did with me. It's exciting, and it makes me look forward to their return, and now we've got a, a good handful of, of great tag teams in, in this in MLW now. We, we were limited to a few over the past year or two, but now they've got some new blood in there with 5150 and a few of these other teams. And uh, wow, I'm looking forward to it, man. It's going to be a good time. And uh, Von Erich says former champs got to be in there in consideration for title shots against Los Parks or whoever the champions have happened to be at that time. They they deserve a, a high spot in there, so uh, I can see why they're why they're angry about it, and uh, they're gonna get their shot, but they may have to do a little work first. Well, Marshall Ross, we know that sometimes you guys have tuned in and listened to what Papa Smokes and I have to say, so just keep in mind that the numbers are not on your side. So if you want, give Papa Smokes and I a call. The Video Bros <laughs> have got your back, boys. We don't mind coming there and keeping all the other guys in line. Not at all. You are friends of, of Ring Respect Radio, and we're friends of the Von Ericks. Speaking of friends of Ring Respect Radio, though, Papa Smokes up next. Our boy Bud fucking Heavy was in action. Yeah. Unfortunately, against Gnarls Garvin. Um, I've been waiting for this debut. I didn't know much about Gnarls Garvin at all going into this, but when he come walking out, I mean, throw the towel in, I'm done. This guy oh, just... Fantastic. White Trash Wonderful, I think, would be the best way to describe him, seeing as that's the way he likes to be described. This man is vicious. He's dirty. He's mean. And he sounds like an absolute asshole when he talks on the microphone. I'm a Gnarls Garvin fan after this. As much as I love Bud Heavy, you poor bastard, you keep getting the toughest sons of bitches to go up against. Yeah, yeah. And I was looking forward to this debut too, partially because I had never seen any of his matches before. This being Gnarls Garvin, uh, I had heard the name before, but I've never watched anything yet. And I, I thought of watching something before he started here, and I thought, nah, I want to see his debut and the way MLW is going to do it. 
Lucky for us, he got put in there against Bud Heavy. Once again, getting a huge reception in Philadelphia. Yeah. Guys with the signs for Bud Heavy and everything, and you could see that Bud was thrilled with his reception. And uh, wow, I'm just loving it. And it's it still is since our interview with uh, him is when that started. Hey, it can't be a coincidence. Yeah, keep that in mind. All of you MLW folks listening and uh, want to uh, start getting a new, <laughs> a new uh, push to the top or at least get the fans behind you. Give us a shout. Be on our show. Bud Heavy did it. Look what it's done for him. It can't be a coincidence. As Papa Smoke said, be on ring respect. It'll do great things for you. But man, Gnarls Garvin gives that promo after the kicking the absolute shit out of Bud Heavy. And he is he is one mean sounding SOB. And I think they said he's from Louisville. I, I'm just something about guys from Louisville. Yeah. Like, they just uh, make you want to slap them sometimes. Apparently, I don't know. I, I've never personally had an issue with anyone from Louisville, but apparently the wrestling community does, or so someone told me once. So anyway, <laughs> speaking of which, I can't wait to see more Gnarls Garvin moving forward. Looking forward to seeing what this guy does in MLW. Um, backstage after that, we had a promo from Holiday and Hammerstone. Um I wrote down, I'm going to write down, it was funny that Holiday says to Alicia to the Canadians celebrate Thanksgiving in like August or something and that it's weird. I had a little bit of a chuckle, but quite frankly, I am getting bored of the Hammerstone and Holiday goof promos backstage. I could really do without these. They are not doing justice to Hammerstone as the champion. Not that everything needs to be serious, but these are really taken away from him as a champion, especially Coming off of Jacob Fatu being such a strong MLW champion, this really kind of thing takes Hammerstone down a peg or two. Um, it plays into what Holiday is for a bit of a character and stuff like that, but I think it takes away from him too because nothing we've seen from Holiday lately outside of being thrown into the war chamber has been much of anything other than these promos, and I'd like to see more in-ring from him. Personally, I that's my personal opinion. Um, they all of a sudden, Cesar Duran's little uh, partner in crime there, his luchador buddy, comes out to try to present some expensive gifts to the two of them. And Holiday seems very interested, but Hammerstone seems reluctant, saying that this is not a gift, that it's uh, they're basically trying to be bought off. So uh, Holiday seemed to be into it, Hammerstone not so much. Also makes me wonder if eventually there could be something that ends up happening between Hammerstone and Holiday. I think that... It's almost been alluded to at times, and it makes me wonder if Holiday wouldn't eventually be bought off by somebody like Cesar Duran in uh, going after Alexander Hammer so moving forward. Yeah, it seems like they've been just teasing a little bit of dissension between Hammerstone and Holiday from uh, the times when they used to be tight when they were in the dynasty with MJF, and uh, they had Gino Medina in there briefly, but... Uh, yeah, I have to agree with you 100% on this, that I, I haven't been enjoying their comedy skits in the back. And the funny thing is, is that I think Holiday is a funny guy. I've heard him say lots of funny stuff in his own promos and stuff, but um, these skits with Hammer just are leaving me totally cold. And and yeah, it, it, it makes... Hammerstone look like a little bit of a goof and when he's the MLW champion I really think he should be set aside from some of that backstage stuff like I mean it's fine to show wrestlers hanging out backstage and stuff but don't show the champ the champ is above all that stuff he's got you got to have the fans believing he's got his own dressing room he's got his suits he's got his bodyguards he's like Hammerstone or whoever the champion is shouldn't be involved in back, backstage shenanigans, I don't think, if if not maybe just once in a while, but not on a regular basis, especially when he's not wrestling matches, uh, because we have seen hide nor hair of him as a wrestler since uh, since he won the belt, except for War Chamber, right, and which was good and everything, but it's been a lot of months now, and uh, we don't have any matches to hang our hat on, and, and all we have is these, promo, these uh, little backstage... Uh, gimmick little skits kind of and uh i don't like it they're not funny and and they they're they're beneath both performers i think so i don't know uh yeah that's that's my feeling about it uh, i don't know what they're going to do about it i sense there's more coming in the future but yeah i'm not down with the uh, comedy skits 
But speaking of skits backstage between two guys that do, or more than two guys that do work up next, we had Emilio Sparks once again making an appearance to interview Kane and company, as I'll refer to them until we actually know his partner in crime's name yeah. there. Uh, starting off with just a pretty standard interview and everything like that until Calvin Tankman comes rushing in. He's being held back by a good eight guys there or something like that. And he's trying to get through them, yelling out, I'm dangerous. And everything about this was just awesome. I loved it. The the fire from Calvin Tankman was brilliant. And I love Alex Kane just sitting on this couch, reaching his arm out, going, yeah, I'm reaching. I'm reaching. I'm reaching. As if he doesn't have a care in the world about Tankman ever actually getting close enough to him to lay down any damage. This is brilliant heel work on the part of Alex Kane. And at the same time, this is exactly what needs to be done with Calvin Tankman right now. He's a big guy. He's fired up. He's tired of being pushed around by this guy who's oppressing him in the in professional wrestling. The guy who cost him his opportunity earlier in the night. This is exactly what wrestling is this is wrestling 101 right here on screen it was genius i loved it yeah i love it and it just uh shows what a good match we're going to get out of these two which i think is going to be great when it actually happens kane versus tankman and if it's for the open weight title uh, that just puts more on the line uh, if that ends up happening at some point and uh good god this is going to be a good feud and this is going to be wild I i'm loving it and I hope they keep them separated for now. Don't blow it off too quick or whatever. I think even having Tankman go up against uh, Kane's uh, partner in crime there and stuff like that before he ever gets his one-on-one -on -one with Alex Kane himself. Like, have Kane be the heel that, you know, keeps talking smack, talking smack, but never actually puts his money where his mouth is against Calvin Tankman and to the point where you can build up that matchup, that one-on-one -on -one encounter for a pay-per-view or, you know, or in MLW's case is one of these bigger events that they'll have coming up sometime in the new year, I think would be absolutely perfect and a great feud for Alex Kane, whether or not the title moves or not. I think this would be perfect for both guys and really puts them in the spotlight. I'm looking forward to this. Loved it. Um, we didn't have another backstage segment from there. This one in Cesar Duran's office. He's got Alicia too and Emilio Sparks there. Uh, questioning whether he actually needs two backstage interviewers or commentators and wants them to tell him why he's got two of them on his payroll. Um, and then I don't know if I, you, you had managed to catch uh, Cesar Duran's lady's name there. That's been a uh, parent in the last couple episodes. I haven't caught her name yet. Um, Carly something or other. There we go. Um, so I do. Yeah. So anyway, she's there as well too. And uh, we've got Alicia, you know, doing the, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm really good at it. I've been here a long time. You know, the what you would expect somebody to say. I gotta say, Emilio Sparks, I actually liked his response when he starts going on about, yeah, it's nice that you've got this cute thing going for you. You're the cute interviewer and it's really cute, but I'm out there in the trenches. This is a war and I'm out there in the war zone. And yeah. I liked that. I thought it was a great response yeah. from Emilio Sparks in this case. And then I liked... Uh, Carly uh, saying that uh, maybe we should just lock the or lock the room and put a put a broom in the door and let them figure it out themselves and say her Durango going that'd be a waste of a good fucking broom. <laughs> <laughs> this was comedy that works something about Cesar Duran when he makes these snide little comments actually gets me chuckling and that's the kind of comedy that I can stand in professional wrestling um, was this segment needed no not necessarily was it terrible no at the same time I didn't hate this segment it was better than what it should have been I guess was be my best opinion of this one sure and I think that um, they're since Cesar Duran has been made the matchmaker, he's become one of the main characters of the show. So um, they're developing his character. And I think I think one of the things that this segment was trying to do was to show that he manipulates everybody. And, and whereas we had two journalists never stepping on each other's toes and working together to put out a good product, now he's got them fighting against each other. Like you say, Sparks is saying, I'm not doing these little puff pieces or little human interest thing. I'm, a, I'm out there getting the real story. So he's causing dissension among them. So it just, it all suggests that that's what he's doing amongst the roster as well. So this is character development for Cesar Duran. And I, I think it's, um, it's a necessary part of the, the whole uh, plot that they're building here with, uh, with what he's going to be up to with this company. Mm -hmm. 
So last but not least, Papa Smokes, the one we really need to unfold to talk about quite a bit. It's the National Open Weight Championship. It was uh, vacated by Alexander Hammerstone after winning the World Championship of MLW. Uh, this one going to be contested in a ladder match to decide the new champion. They had announced that there would be a mystery opponent or somebody added to the match that wasn't announced. Uh, the ones that were announced, we got Alex Shelley, Myron Reed, Alex Kane, and Zenshi. Uh, the addition ended up being ACH. Maybe not. I, and again, no offense to ACH. He's a fantastic human being as far as I know and a good wrestler. Not as impactful as they tried to sell it as. But there was a lot of people very excited about ACH's addition. But I think somebody else might have been at least given us a little bit more thought that there was a chance they'd win it. I didn't think for a minute that ACH was coming out of that with the open weight Championship. Uh, but your thoughts on that? Yeah, I felt the same way. We we did have ACH in, in MLW uh, uh, in the past two years. He's been kind of amongst the sort of upper card guys in this federation. But uh, uh, what happened with him, Munson? Did he retire for a bit or was he injured? I think he might have retired or he just took an extended break away from wrestling for a bit there. My understanding was he announced that he was retiring, that he okay. wasn't coming back. So that was technically the surprise but because i didn't follow closely enough maybe it wasn't quite as impactful on me yeah yeah well i i, I couldn't quite remember either but this this kind of had the smell of of that they just needed a guy uh of a certain level to you know of the national open weight championship level to be in this match and they they just needed a guy kind of and that that's fine and everything and ach is He's a good, accomplished wrestler. I don't find him like an overly exciting personality for wrestling. And that's also fine that, uh, that you can be just a wrestler too and uh, not have to have a, a, a gimmicky character or anything like that. But uh, like you say, it, it didn't really add to the match that much because you knew there wasn't a hope in hell that he was walking out with that belt because he didn't have any build and there was nothing sold to him towards uh, the you know before this match uh, occurred or anything so uh yeah i was more looking at the other uh, four competitors as trying to, as to pick a winner well and you know one i will kind of write off as saying i didn't think he was going to walk out the champion but i was looking forward to every minute that he was out there was our boy <laughs> zenchi yeah <laughs> and from the start when he came out and he pulls out the flag that we thought was an mlw flag at the, but he's changed it it's now the zlw it's the zenchi league wrestling i chuckled at this in a great way i popped for it i loved it and man did zenshi not give us some of the most memorable moments oh. of this entire matchup like as great good and solid as this was and the solid work that from some of these guys uh before i even say what zenshi did and one of the big spots i really like from him i gotta say a lot more wrestling in this than i would have expected from a five-man ladder match uh, I liked that the spots weren't completely stupid. I believe one of the spots I really liked was, I can't remember who it was that went to do a, uh, they went to go off the top ropes onto their opponent. And as they did, the opponent not only moved, but I believe it was Alex Shelley from the outside pushed the ladder in the way so that the dude would end up fucking hitting the ladder and ended up taking the bump that way. I thought <clears throat> that's so much better than a guy laying on a ladder, waiting all that time, and he rolls off and dude hits the ladder. This one, there was a lot of things that could have gone wrong in the setup, but man, it felt more real because dude rolls out of the way, Shelley notices the opportunity to put extra harm on an opponent in the ring, and it involved three guys instead of having two doing some cooperation like you'd see from a lot of other ladder matches from big companies. Um, then that move from Zenshi, like when him and fucking, uh, oh, hold on here, I, you might have to correct me, I believe it was Myron Reed that was on the ladder there with him towards the end, and you're wondering like, okay, maybe Myron's going to win this, and Zenshi gets pushed down by Myron Reed, or at least we think that he's been pushed down by Myron Reed, and out of nowhere, you see Zenshi's legs pop up to the top of the ladder he is doing a full-on goddamn handstand on the ladder and then pulls myron reed by with his legs into a hurricanrana frankenstein whatever you call it from off the ladder there Papa folks 
what an awesome spot. I popped for this. I know it was a big spot. Uh, man, it looked good. It wasn't too cooperative. It was a nice, interesting thing and exactly what I wanted from Zenshi. Um, the other big spot from Zenshi I liked too was his attempt to get the belt when he jumped off the ropes and he got so much air time that I think he, I almost think he purposely did not grab that belt because the way he jumped, I kind of thought Zenshi could grab that damn thing. Well, yeah, that's the spot I was going to bring up because it was very early in the match too. And, you know, like guys, longtime fans like us like a little bit of realism in our professional wrestling and, you know, everybody always thinks in a ladder match, why doesn't someone just run up and grab it right now? Like you could, you know, there's many opportunities where a guy would actually have time to climb up and grab it if he actually wanted to. So this, at, in the first two minutes of the match or something, Zenshi does, there's all these high-flying wrestlers in the match anyway. Why doesn't somebody take a shot? Zenshi does the old springboard with the feet on the top rope and just dives for it. He got his hand on it, but couldn't quite pull it down and, of course, took a bump as he fell because it was a desperate leap. But, man, that's the kind of thing. I've never once seen that in a ladder match. It's it's so creative. I've thought of it before. Why doesn't somebody jump off the top rope onto the ladder and just grab it quickly you know if it was a real competition and everybody wanted to win somebody would try that well somebody's tried it now and, and zen she the perfect guy to do it he didn't quite get a hold of the belt and it was a little early in the match and i don't he wasn't booked to win this thing but the, the spot was beautiful and it it gave that that ring of realisticness that we all like to see in the match I believe the closest thing I've seen to it, I want to believe, is when Seth Rollins initially won the Money in the Bank before he became champion for the first time. He actually leapt off the ropes onto the ladder as somebody else was there, took them out and pulled it down right away kind of thing, which was a nice touch and something that hadn't been seen. But, you know, to the credit here, like, Zenji, yeah, I mean, I almost feel like because <laughs> he couldn't grab that thing and ruin this matchup because he was not the guy to be winning this thing. I think he held back. I honestly think Zenshi, it, it, for all it's worth, is very capable of springboarding off that rope and grabbing a belt without using the ladder. I really think the ability there is there, Papa Smokes. And, man, I pop for this. I, again, Zenshi, every single time, he's not the guy that's going to be uh, necessarily winning belts. He's not your main event guy. But he is the guy that will give you moments that are memorable and... And he still gives you realism in there, too. When he gets down to it, he really can get going with these boys. And a lot of talent in this kid. I like Zenshi a lot, and I think he was a great addition to this. I think a guy like Alex Shelley helped ground this matchup quite a bit. I really liked his addition. Myron Reed, we know, has got a lot of talent. But then you got Alex Kane. And I liked how all the baby faces at the start, it was a big... You know, let's team up and beat the crap out of this absolute jerk, Alex Kane. And they gave Kane the opportunity to shred some of these guys quite well. Kane looked like an absolute beast in there. And then he just bided his time. He didn't have to cheat to win or anything like that. He bided his time, waited for the opportunity, got in there, and stole the matchup from everybody. Alex Kane, the new National Open Weight Championship. I loved everything about this match. I thought this was one of the better multi-man uh, ladder matches I think I've seen in I don't know how long. I could honestly say at least over a decade. This Nothing has even come close. Yeah, I, personally, I'm no fan of, of ladder matches, really. I mean, there are some good ones. I, I like uh, Michaels versus Ramon in, in some of those uh, just two-man ones. I think it starts to get... Any match starts to get boggled up when there's more than three or four guys in it, but uh, this was quite well done. I thought it was good. We, we kind of had the feeling that that uh, Alex Kane might be one of the front runners to be the next open weight champion, and uh, he's been getting a huge push. He, I think he deserves it. He's got the look. He's got a good promo, and he's the suplex assassin. I mean, he's chucking guys' heads through the mat on a regular basis. This is the kind of guy you want as as your next open weight champion. Uh, the shoes that Hammerstone leaves are, are pretty big to fill, but I think Alex Kane up to the task. Um, he uh, he's newer to the company and all that, but we're getting very familiar with him. Put the strap around his waist and let's get some title defenses going. This is going to be fun, and 
I'm loving, uh, I think this was a good decision to put Alex Kane over in this match. And uh, really, really quite good stuff. And uh, yeah, they, they took the ladder match, kind of shook it up a little bit and gave us something different. And uh, I, I enjoyed this quite a lot. Zenshi was the standout for me, but uh, Alex Kane going over in this good stuff and a good uh, decision by the booker in MLW. Couldn't agree more, and so Alex Kane topping off the great episode of MLW Fusion Alpha on Thanksgiving. So, boom, I a new champion at the end of this one. Great episode. Uh, Papa Smokes, we're going to move right on into MLW Fusion episode 11. Uh, so this one kicked off uh, right away with the match that we were talking about that got set up just on the last episode. Uh, Casey Navarro taking on Warhorse. Uh, this match was pretty much exactly what I expected it to be. And no disappointment here at all. Uh, these two put on a really decent uh, warm-up match of the night. A lot of great things from the two of them. Warhorse, he's entertaining. He gets in there. He's got some great look, great fight. Casey Navarro is slick inside that ring. He's got a great look to him. A standout look, too. He's not only just a decent-looking young guy. He That pink hair and his tights and everything like that is such a drastic change from the typical black shorts and long hair that you see a lot of guys come out with in pro wrestling. Casey Navarro stands out like a sore thumb. His in-ring work is very nice, well put together. Uh, he's still very young, still very green at the same time, a lot of work to go, but I like that we're getting to see the development of this kid in MLW. I thought the match was solid and Navarro picking up a win over Warhorse I think looks fantastic on Navarro, especially if MLW have long long-term plans for this kid moving forward yeah and he might be part of the uh, alliance they've made with the uh, mexican promotions as well they're going to get some of their guys uh, some wins and and maybe some gold here and there and we'll see about that in the future but yeah like you say this is a warm-up match it was good uh, i think navarro's getting a little push here and this is good and uh, I thought Warhorse was good too. Um, these two are, are like opposites of each other in the way they conduct themselves and the way they, their appearance uh, comes across. And Warhorse is entertaining. I mean, a lot of people think he's cheesy and stuff like that. I think it's just the right amount. I think um, he's good. A lot of the kids like him. A lot of the uh, guys like him in the crowd and uh and uh, he's got his head banging you know you can't hurt his head if you hit it into the turnbuckle because he's so used to head banging etc etc he's got the uh, heavy metal character down perfectly and yeah right now he's pretty much uh, uh, a preliminary talent i guess and uh, doing jobs in mlw on a probably shot to shot basis kind of thing but uh uh, I'm glad to see Warhorse get on TV here and gets a little bit more prominence, and I, I think he'll eventually get some traction and uh, get his career going as well. Yeah, Warhorse seems like he uh, is pretty much the living example of what would happen if they plucked someone right out of the show Metalocalypse and put him into a pro yeah. wrestling ring. Um, I think that's kind of where his gimmick somewhat comes from, even the name Warhorse and everything like that. I know it's all evolved around heavy metal, but even some of the imagery he uses seems very much... Like he was a big fan of Metalocalypse and that he's using some of that in his gimmick. I, I like it. It can be fun. It's just the right amount of fun. And again, I don't mind that he's in the spot of being a guy that put other guys over. I don't think Warhorse is a character that necessarily needs the wins to be able to stand out. Yeah. Where someone like Navarro, especially with how young he is and the way that his career could go, I think he needs a win over a guy like Warhorse more than Warhorse needed the win over Casey Navarro. Uh, from there, unless I missed something, Pop Smokes, uh, my notes, I got right down to the next match, the tag match. We had Willow Nightingale uh, joining the commentary team. Again, I have no problems here. We know Willow Nightingale was on commentary once before. I think she's a fantastic talker. She knows how to talk inside the ring, and I think she adds a lot of value, especially when talking about the women involved with the featherweight division. Uh, this one here, a tag match, finally. A uh, tag match that was between two actual tag teams. We got... The top togs, uh, Devian and Skylar, I believe their names are, against the Sea Stars. And this one I was really looking forward to. I was surprised. Top dogs, they've got an entrance, that uh, tag type entrance. They look like they're a tag team. I was actually invested in these two as a uh, tag team as well. I didn't know they existed. This was the first time I got to see them. I think they worked 
quite well. I know that obviously MLW is going to want to push the C stars at the moment because this is the direction they're going and everything. But I think this was a good solid matchup between the two teams. There was good tag team wrestling. I like the tandem moves that we get from the C-Stars, including their finishing move, the Tidal Wave, I think is a solid look from them. I like the dynamic of their team, too. We got two uh, two sisters, one of which, obviously, uh, the uh, I, I don't want to use the word large. I mean, she is just a more physically intimidating uh, person than her sister is. But at the same time, the two of them work great together in that sense. Their tandem teamwork work looks beautiful and stuff like that. I think this was a great, uh, acceptable match uh, in the tag division. I think the Sea Stars look good in this win. And I think that uh, the top dogs, I, I wouldn't mind seeing them stick around. I would like to see more of them in MLW. Yeah, I also like the top dogs. I, I don't know who these people are. This is my first time seeing or hearing about them. Uh, yeah, they came out as a team and all that. Uh, once they got working in the ring, they reminded that they have kind of a throwback thing going on in their style. I think they reminded me of one of those, uh, tough lady tag teams from the eighties. Uh, do you remember when we used to review some of those old matches, uh, from the eighties on, on a uh, ring respect radio in the old days, the, they remind me of like Joyce Grable and Judy Martin or, or, or a couple of those, they look like. Uh, tough ladies that are like uh, 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 work in the on the CBs with the truckers or something like that you know like the lady that that could maybe punch you out in the bar later if you said the wrong thing to her that that's kind of what these ladies struck me as well and the throwback idea I like their pops most too because if you look at their video that played on the screen almost seemed like a throwback to the old GNR logo from the 80s as well too uh, for the top dog so it's neat that you caught the throwback in the ring as well too because I think they just in general they're a throwback team and yeah yeah I, I think it's a good move and and I liked it they uh they were worked effectively as a team they isolated Delmi XO in the corner uh rule breaking double teaming that kind of stuff good tag team work they they've learned the art of tag team wrestling somewhere because it's a lot more complex than a singles match with uh, tags and the referee and the rule breaking and stuff. It was really nice. Uh, I had a couple more notes here that were a little bit amusing. Uh, uh, Willow Nightingale on commentary said at one point, Ashley coming in like a house on fire with so much spunk on her. <laughs> Yeah. That one kind of uh, perked my ears up a little bit. I, I, I bet she wishes she could take that one back or change that one a little bit. Uh, at one point, Ashley Vox had one of the top dogs in the ring and was uh, fish her fish hooking her with the uh, finger in the side of the mouth. And I was thinking, uh, this tag team uses more nautical puns than Shark Boy used to uh, with the fish hook. But anyway... Uh, then there was another spot that I wasn't completely crazy about in this match because uh, the top dogs were were coming into the ring lots without tagging and the referee wasn't noticing or wasn't enforcing this. There was a sequence where they switched, uh, where I should say that the dogs switched once with no tag, then the sea stars switched once with no tag, then when they did the tidal wave at the end, which requires both, they didn't tag on that one either. Tighten it up a little, ladies. And that's that's not just them. That's the ref. And that's anyone that's helping them set this match up, such as an agent or uh, or anybody else representing MLW. You got to tighten that up a little bit. Fans notice that stuff. And I realize that uh, the, even the big leagues are much looser on that stuff these days than they used to be. But... It looks a bit sloppy. I like the match and everything, and I liked everybody in it, but I just wish they would tighten up some of that stuff. That's my only constructive criticism for this match. Otherwise, I quite liked it. And then we got more of uh, Holodead attacking Willow Nightingale at the commentary again, at the commentary table, pardon me, and then they fought off into the back. So this is really the, the big angle and the big feud they've got going in this ladies' featherweight division. Holiday versus Willow Nightingale. 
Yeah, and uh, I have all day for it, too. I like Willow Nightingale. I like Holiday a lot. I think that one's going extremely well. They're playing it out well. And again, we haven't even had the one-on-one -on -one encounter between them or no indication when we'll see an MLW featherweight championship. So, I mean, they're allowing all of this to unfold before us before even introducing the title and going to that extent. I think which is a nice touch because we get to see who going forward are their top people in this uh, featherweight division. We're going to see an influx of... Uh, new talent coming in. I believe that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, they did announce that Rock Seas agreed to uh, some open spots with MLW here now that Ring of Honor is not going to have stuff going on. Again, there's a plethora of talent over there that could be making crossovers with the MLW featherweight division. I mean, with the divisions going on over in Impact Wrestling, we've got the women that were working with Ring of Honor. Unfortunately, uh, not so much anymore at the moment. Uh, that's uh, story for another time uh, and then uh, you've got also the NWA with a plethora of uh, great ladies wrestlers over there as well too so I mean there's just tons that the MLW team can do in pushing these stars and the great thing is like here's an example we'll bring up Ring of Honor for just one moment uh, getting used to R Willow Nightingale here on MLW television and she has a match against Roxy on Ring of Honor ends up being a great match and I found myself more invested because MLW had done such a good job with billing building Willow Nightingale for me on their show that that made me more acceptable to watch her match over on the Ring of Honor show so great job by MLW with this featherweight division it's uh, it's going off great so far uh, moving on from there we went to back to Kane and company as I like to call them here pop smokes until we get that name uh, Kane dropping a great promo and this looked like a very sports based promo I mean sitting backstage at a table being talked to by uh, sports interviewers and saying that he's sworn off America's top team he is now starting something brand new this is going to become the boom IA fight club so this is the boom IA I've been referring to on the show here tonight so he kept saying that uh, they're going to make boom IA a famous thing like Ollie in the jungle or all these kind of things I can see this catching on this is one of those things that I can just see people getting behind it's one of those quirky little comments that I can see the fans chanting along at times whether they hate Alex Kane or not or you know when he one day when somebody drops him on his head in a matchup or something like that just yelling out boom I ate to get under his skin yeah I think this is fantastic Alex Kane has got to be one of my favorite things going in MLW right now yeah I liked the look of this promo too it had that real sports look like you said kind of like a little press conference uh, before a match or after a match he Alex Kane looks like he's just brimming with confidence right now and uh, and rightfully so he should he's getting a huge push in a company that's getting bigger and developing and getting more of a tv presence in america and around the world so why wouldn't he be uh, confident now he's got his new friend you're calling him a partner in crime i have him in my notes as his friend because we still don't have his name here but he's got his backup his sidekick and uh, maybe they'll have some tag matches Maybe that guy will act as his bodyguard or a manager kind of interfering from outside. We could see that quite easily. And, uh, yeah, the, the sky's the limit for Alex Kane right now. Bodyguard I get. Manager, I'm not sure. That's a bun big motherfucker. I want to see him get more physically involved than a manager typically yeah. does their pop smoke. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I'm much looking forward to what these two guys bring to the table. I, I mean, it's been nothing but solid from Alex Kane and co. so far. Uh, from there, we had a 5150 promo. Uh, this was it was solid. I mean, 5150. Everything they say is believable. They get really jazzed up. Um, Dr. Julius Smokes. All right, let's throw our attention to Dr. Julius Smokes here, and we're gonna do this on every time we talk about 5150 here on Bring Respect Radio. Dr. Julius Smokes, one of these days you're going to tune into the show and you're going to listen up. We've been throwing down the challenge, Mr. Weed Smoking Expert, to come and put your mouth where your money is. Come and have a smoke off against the video bros. And we'll put the name Smokes on the line. If you can even try to keep up to the two of us, then come and put your money where your mouth is. Stop with the little burp and all this kind of stuff and come on down, roll one up, and smoke one with your boys, the video bros. You could call us, or we could call you. Just let us know the time, the place, and what type of weed you want to be down with. And you got yourself a challenge, motherfucker, because we're down anytime, any place. Paul Smokes, over to you. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I'm going to continue that a little bit too, Dr. Julius. And uh, I like your promos, and I like your presence with 5150, but 
you married into the name Papa Smokes, into the Smokes last name. I'm a real Smokes. I'm a bloodline Smokes. So I'll show you. I'll smoke you down to ashes, brother, if you want to come up here and roll one with me and Bobby Munson. And it's all in the spirit of having fun with wrestling and all that. But uh, let's do it, man. I've seen you guys showing some of the chronic. We got some kicking around here, too. Let's let's roll up some big blunts and hit it hard. Yeah. And everybody, make sure you send it out. If you, if nothing else, just clip this part of this podcast and send that over to Dr. Julia Spokes because he needs to know what's going down. Anyway, great promo from 5150. What else can we say? I like these guys. They're real, and they want to get a title shot, and obviously they're going to get it. It has been announced on the next episode. They're going to get their Philly Street fight against uh, Los Parks for the titles this time. Uh, when I heard this announcement, Papa Smokes, all I could say is, I hope this doesn't turn out to be like the last encounter. And we're going to get to that here uh, once we get to that episode. Um, last but not least here, this was a little bit shorter episode than the one from the previous week. But we were down to our final matchup. Uh, this one, the Opera Cup final. This one was allotted quite a bit of time on this here card. TJP and Davey Richards, second encounter between these two. And this time it's for the Opera Cup. Um, I I remember us praising the hell out of the first encounter with these two guys. Uh, it was fantastic from start to finish, so I was very much looking forward to this. And I, I I sometimes have my fears that it's like, can guys go out there and give me something that I'm going to be equally as excited about? But I think on top of the fact that the Opera Cup being on the line and everything like that, this was equally as slick and good inside the ring as what the first encounter was with these two guys. Again, with that added bonus of you know, is TJP going to pull this one off this time around? Could this be Davy Richards' first defeat? Uh, will they go forward with TJP as the Opera Cup winner? I mean, that could have stirred up quite a bit of controversy for MLW. I mean, it the writing on the wall felt like Davy Richards the whole time, but there was times in this match where I thought TJP had his number. Again, a lot of great technical stuff back and forth from these two guys. They clearly know each other inside that ring extremely well uh their styles link up perfectly uh davy richards did get the win in very similar fashion to the way that he beat tjp the first time around um this was solid pop smokes i liked it from start to finish davy richards nice promo at the end of the night i think made the fans happy after they had to listen to tjp at the beginning uh, before the match started, talking about how he disrespects the people that are followers of the science on Facebook, and now they're all friends with some sort of know-it-all doctor. Um, TJ, please, again, we we mentioned it before, taking up the heat just perfectly, brilliantly, and I think that's what made this matchup so magical. Davey Richards finally getting that win. He gets that huge pop in Philly as a result of beating somebody that the fans just absolutely despise. Uh, solid matchup once again. Uh, proven TJP is a great in-ring technician. And, you know, again, Davey Richards, once again, proven that he is a fantastic in-ring technician and somebody that the company is obviously relying on and pushing to the moon. For sure. And this this was one of the best matches I've seen in a long time and uh, on, on MLW or on any show. And you could see that they had allotted... 30 minutes for this match, including the entrances and stuff. So this was going to be a long match, a 25-minuter. That means that they have two guys that can handle a big, long main event like that. This was just excellent. This was old-school wrestling done perfectly for a new generation who obviously loved it. These guys started grappling and chain wrestling at the beginning. Neither one got the clear advantage for the first six or seven minutes by my notes here. Uh, there was just uh, reversals and it just a nice ex, uh, a nice uh, exhibition of each guy's professional wrestling skill. The, uh, the match eventually, after about 10 minutes, went to the outside, started to break down there. The, the first striking we even saw was at the 10-minute mark once the match went to the outside. A couple big chops along the crowd barrier there. Boy, that's always fun being a fan in the front row. You get a guy's chest getting slapped all to hell right in front of you and the noise and the impact and the movement. It's just so exciting. Lucky fans there. Um, Richards took control in the middle of this working TJP's legs. This was quite uh, captivating as well. It shows that Richards has a game plan and a strategy for this match. Knew that he would have to uh, incapacitate TJP's legs and... Uh, 
There was a figure four leg lock. There was a trailer hitch submission hold in that. There were reversals, all kinds of stuff. Now TJP's limping around, and you know that that affects his offense a little bit for coming off the ropes and stuff. Now they're fighting on the on the apron. TJP hits a fisherman's suplex on the apron. My God, what a bump that was. Gets out, throws uh, Richards right back into the ring, hits a frog splash, two count. Oh boy, I, th- I could have seen that being the finish right there, but it wasn't. Good, no. It's a false finish, good one. Crowd starts to really pick up at this point. Now Richards hits a double foot stomp off the top rope onto the apron onto TJP. Wow, that's got to hurt. Then throws him into the ring and hits another two-foot stomp off the top rope. Two count. There's another false finish. Good God. On the other side. Now the ankle lock in the middle. Now the brain buster from Richards on TJP. And then the knee bar in the middle of the ring. TJP now, after that last series of devastating moves and holds, He gets that knee bar right in the middle of the ring and there's nothing you can do. There's nothing anyone could do but tap out. This match was just wonderful because it didn't make TJP look any weaker after this. Richards remains a great babyface, the people's champion, the hard-working man that is the lone American wolf but also likes, likes the support of the fans and likes to congratulate them and give some love out to them too, but... Man, this was perfect. And then uh, Richard's words afterwards, I don't have a family anymore. Wrestling is my family. There's nothing that brings the fans on your side than than some nice sentimentality like that. And, and Richard's has that nice face too. He looks like he means it. Like he delivers these lines with conviction. And uh, I shouldn't say lines. He probably just came up with that on the top of his head because this is a company that isn't one of the main ones that scripts their promos. Anyway, I loved this Opera Cup final. I love the Opera Cup as a tournament overall uh, because it, it gives something special for the guys to work for that isn't one of the belts where you don't have to have complex booking for afterwards and defenses and all that and angles and everything. This is just a tourney which probably was taped in one night but we get throughout various weeks on TV and uh, this was just beautiful and to Davy Richards, a very uh, worthy winner of the Opera Cup, looked great holding it up in the ring after that. Makes for good TV, and this is a, a an awesome segment and an awesome match. Yeah, and it's it as you're going through some of the different spots in this match, I'm just picturing it in my head again. Pop Smokes, just how brilliant it was, uh, how brilliant these two have been in both their encounters. And I could honestly say, as we're coming close to the end of 2021, that if I was putting together a top 10 matches of the year, that these two matches would be within, definitely within my top five, if not right at the very top of it, if not one and two. These matches were both excellent. This one, again, adding the Opera Cup uh, to it, the uh, you know, just having something that these two are fighting for outside of a spot in a main event, this, this was Phenomenal. I loved every bit of it, and nothing that Davey Richards has done since coming to MLW has gone wrong whatsoever. He is great. Uh, TJP has made me a fan of his in-ring work. I love what he's doing, and I love that he's embracing exactly who he is and is not apologetic about it at all. Great work. Great episode of MLW. Loved every bit of it. Uh, but, you know, now I'm going to have to be a little bit sour, Pop Smokes. It's sour time because we're moving over to MLW Fusion Alpha, episode number 12. So as I mentioned, Pop Smokes are going to be a little bit sour on this one. Uh, This night of episode 12 started off with Cesar Duran in the ring with a briefcase full of money. And this is going to be one of his many opportunities that he's spoken about. Uh, One of the things that he really did over in Lucha Underground. And I like the idea of of this. And when he announces that this is going to be taking place between Ares and Aramis, I I was thinking, okay, I I can get behind this. These two guys, a couple of young guys came out, uh, put on a really good display in their last matchup. I think the commentary guys were really overselling it, calling it one of the best matches of the year. I wouldn't necessarily say one of the best of the year, but definitely a strong debut from these two guys in MLW in their first encounter. 
Uh, Aries coming out now teamed up with Holodead and Dr. Dax. I thought, fantastic. This is a great look as well, too. Here's my where I'm going to be a little bit sour, and it's not that this was a bad match, so please nobody take this out of context and think that I'm trying to shit all over these guys. This felt like two young guys who were told, you did an excellent job last time. Here's your opportunity to go out there again. And they wanted to one-up themselves from everything they did last time to the point where this felt more cooperative. It felt like there was maybe a couple of miscues in this one that were very noticeable at times and stuff like that too. Um, so there was a lot about this one that I felt kind of fell flat for me compared to their first encounter because it felt like they were they were trying to do things that they weren't as comfortable doing where they should have just maybe even sharpened up the stuff they did from their first matchup and I think they could have outshined it. Uh, I do got to say though when I believe it was Aramis that had the razor's edge or the uh, the ed, uh, that jackknife powerbomb, no sorry jackknife powerbomb, that, that edge powerbomb uh, lifted up Eddie throws Aramis how far outside the ring onto that ramp that was a beautiful looking spot that was fantastic and there was a lot to like about this match these two guys are very talented Aries I think he's got quite the interesting uh, this strange style look that they allude to I think was great and again Holiday and Dr. Dax at side hair nice little faction that could be building there um, so there was some good things I can say about this one uh, these uh, the talent of the two guys and the things that they were very comfortable doing were very notable but there was seemed to be that those few spots where it felt a little too cooperative and a couple of missed opportunities just due to the fact that they wanted to go that extra mile compared to their first encounter yeah i'm gonna have to agree with your uh uh feelings about that one this uh this is a good starting match for this show i think uh a couple of luchadors having a fast match here these are also uh, two guys that are right in the runnings towards uh, shots at the middleweight title held by Tajiri right now. So that adds a little bit of weight to it. Um, yeah, like I say, this is a classic Lucha match. I do like the Lucha style, but sometimes it's very cooperative. Uh, I, was, I have it in my notes here. The whole first minute of the match, they had their two hands clasped together while doing spots. They didn't let go for so long, and they did all their spots clasping their two hands together. Yeah, okay, I can see it for a bit, but this seemed a little bit forced. Uh, they had the pace very, very fast in this, and and so many spots, the reversals of spots, switching back and forth that it's, it's almost a little bit disorienting sometimes. I also think um, when the pace is that fast that... Like you said, the the couple of little mistakes that happen weren't even big botches or anything like that, but small mistakes, they look very obvious when the pace is that fast. When it's a little bit slower, you can you can cover it up with lots of stuff. But um, uh, I also think about the fast pace of some of these uh, uh, luchador matches. Sometimes when there's a good spot or a good big giant bump there that it continues too fast after that and it doesn't give the fans time to kind of digest what just happened Let, let's use that uh, example that you said of one of the big hard spots in this that kind of razor's edge to the uh to the entrance ramp wow big toss and a big impact and a big bump for aries to take and uh they just continued on right after it and uh and and i think you could have given the fans a few moments to react to that. You could have given the uh, Aries some uh, time to sell that, you know, to really show that, man, that took a lot out of him and this might change the complexion of this match. There's a lot of things you can do after a big spot like that, but one of the best things you can do is is nothing, is, is to let the fans, this is their moment now to really uh, soak this in, to cheer, to chant, to comment on it this is what the fans like to do is is tell everybody what they thought of this spot so when the match goes too fast it just gets back into more spots and and then the fans don't remember the the big bumps and the big spots as well so this is my again the yeah just little criticism it, it's nobody's going to listen to this uh at my advice it's a style like this is and this is how the style in wrestling is going now is 
more fast, faster paced matches, less time in between bumps, less selling and all that. So, I mean, the, this is the trend that it's going on, but I, I, I just think that it takes the fans out of the equation a little bit, give them some time to digest each of those big spots, and it, I think their, their match becomes more memorable after that. Yeah, and you know, we say that it's trending in that direction, and you're not wrong on that, Bob Smokes, but the problem with that is, is what are the matches that everybody's been talking about in 2021? They tend to be the matches where people are taking it more seriously, where they're selling, where they're slowing it down at times. Uh, those are the matches that are sticking out like a sore thumb from, from everybody, and the reason that they're doing that is for the exact same reasons that you're saying. It might seem like the great thing to go fast, and that you can go fast. I mean... Let's just say it right now. Walter and Dragunov went fast in their matchup in so many ways, but they did take enough time to sell and make it believable at the same time. And I think that you can use that kind of faster pace than what you know people saw in the 70s and 80s that they seem to be so heavily against and use that in a way that still pays honor to that style of professional wrestling, allowing it to soak in and everything like that so that you remember the whole match as a whole and you don't remember just little pieces of it at the same time yeah yeah i think it's something to think about and uh uh eventually uh Arez got the pinfall and the briefcase uh off a distraction from hola dead and dr dax so like you say we might have a little bit of a weird faction going there with these uh unusual types of uh people we have going here with hola dead dr dax and Arez. And uh, this is looking nice. I like the little bit of cheating. They got the money. Then they were backstage later wondering how they were going to spend all the money. This is nice. We're getting, we're coloring up these characters a little bit and getting something going here. So I'm, yeah, the match wasn't uh, completely my cup of tea, but I think it still fulfilled the purpose they needed it to in having uh, uh, a little bit of action around the uh, contenders for the middleweight title and getting uh Paula Dead's uh, faction going. And I've always enjoyed adding like this kind of stipulation where they're fighting for extra pay. I mean, we all know that guys out there get in the ring, guys and gals both get in the ring and expect a payday at the end of it. But when you can have a matchup where the promoter, or in this case, the matchmaker, Cesar Duran, says here is this match and outside of what you would normally be paid to do your wrestling job that you do all the time, this is your opportunity right now to make some extra money. It is a good look. It gives the match a little bit more dynamic. And again, it does something that you can add without adding more titles. You don't need 60 titles in a professional wrestling company. And not everybody has to be fighting for a title. But it still gives them something to fight for at the end of the day. Uh, that portion of it was fantastic. Again, my nitpicks of it are same, similar to yours. Pretty much on par, I'd say. Uh, again, nothing against these two guys. I think that they're going to do great things. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing more of them. And this didn't put me off of them. I just think that, again, these are a couple of young guys that were told, go out and do better than last time. And unfortunately, better than last time didn't have to mean going 100 miles an hour faster than last time. It meant maybe slow it down a touch or two, tighten up the shit you did the last time, and look like the pros that you are. You guys will get it. I'm not. I don't doubt that for a second. Uh, from there, backstage, Emilio Sparks does an interview with Myron Reed. Seems like he's almost kind of throwing a little bit of shade. He's talking about being in the trenches. Now he's throwing shade at Reed, trying to make it seem like maybe Reed is kind of putting a little bit of a wrench in the into Calvin Tankman and really questioning whether or not Reed is actually full on Tankman's buddy and friend and stuff like that. Uh, from there, again, uh, you're gonna. I'm gonna toss to you, Papa Smokes, for the name is Carly Perez. I think you were saying. Yep. Yes, Carly Perez comes in and uh, mentions that Myron Reed has started to really fall in MLW. He's kind of taken a fall from grace. He lost his friend. He lost his faction. Because we know Jordan Oliver no longer with MLW. Uh, and from there, she said that you are going to fall even further before you ever rise to being who you are. Um, this again almost may, alludes to the idea of Myron Reed. Could he take a turn uh, at some point in time? Uh, is she alluding to maybe an unholy alliance with her and Cesar Duran at some time for the young goat as well, too? Um, tough to say. I mean, they've built up the idea that he's buddies with Calvin Tangman, but they've never played strongly on it enough that I couldn't see him being a turn on Calvin Tangman or even having Myron Reed team up with the Bumaye Fight Club even. That's an interesting idea for sure. I didn't think of that one. 
I really liked this segment though because uh, Myron Reed started off sounding pretty fiery here when Sparks was accusing of him maybe being a little bit washed up or something like that. Myron was not having any of that. And then when Carly Perez came out with the tarot cards and started giving him a little reading, that was nice. That was a, I liked uh, when Selena de la Renta did stuff like that with the kind of witchier side of the of the Mexican spookiness kind of, and uh, she's reading his cards and saying, "Yeah, you're gonna fall a lot further before you, you before you get any better, but uh, my hands will be there to lift you up." Yeah. So again, we see this backstage manipulation coming from Cesar Duran and Camp. We still don't know what their end game is. It seems like he might want to take over. MLW completely from the owner Court Bauer. We don't know. We assume that this might have something to do with it, but the way the uh, kind of subterfuge is being played back behind the scenes is very interesting, and I, I, I thought this was a good segment. I also think that um, I'm interested in what happens with Myron Reed because when I first started watching MLW, he was kind of mid-card tag team type guy, but when he got the uh, the middleweight championship he became uh, a better wrestler and a better um, promo and everything you saw the improvement in him and you saw his uh, gain of confidence that he had after that so when I look at their roster now I think of Myron Reed as one of the big guys he's not a main event guy but he's one of the big guys in in that company that I think they should uh, put time and energy and effort into and I hope this is uh, the start of a good angle for him because I think he'll be worth it and I think in in coming years he'll be a top guy in that company yeah I couldn't agree with you more Papa Smokes I think it's heading in that direction and I'd love to see it I love to see in some way they keep Myron Reed used on television as well too because he has become you know one of the uh, the mainstays of MLW as of late and I'm glad that they continue to Put time and effort into this kid. I think he's got a great future ahead of him. Uh, then from there, we went to a backstage uh, backstage attack, I guess, so to speak. Um, Hammerstone scheduled to be in action. They show him backstage, and out of nowhere, attacked by Matanza Duran. And now at first, I did question this a little bit, Pop Smokes, because Matanza was brought out at the War Chamber to be on Hammerstone's team and unmasked himself as Jeff Cobb, who is who played Matanza Duran or Matanza Cueto if, for the Lucha Underground fans. So I was kind of, at first when I saw this, I'm like, wait a second, what uh, what's the angle here kind of thing? But then I got to give kudos to Rich Bokini and I, I'm sorry, I forget the other new guy's name there. Joe Dombrowski. There we go, that's right on. Uh, so these two did a great job of explaining that it seems like, and you've, you've alluded it to it too over this uh, entire podcast tonight, Cesar Duran playing the manipulation game and stuff like that, uh, almost seeming like Cesar Duran used this opportunity to bring in somebody that, you know, definitely is on his side and his brother Matanza Duran uh, in order to make sure that he had Hammerstone and the boys defeat Contra. He had to put all he could into the defeation of uh, the deletion or defeat of Contra, basically taking out the strongest faction and the biggest threat to MLW in general in the Contra unit. And now it seems like Cesar Duran is holding all the cards. He's playing that manipulation game. He's using what he can to get what he wants. And it seems like now he is going to be uh, trying to go back after Hammerstone after Hammer did not seem interested in taking his buy off from Cesar Duran. He knows that he can't manipulate Hammerstone. So now he wants to take him out. He sends in Matanza Duran, who I think that would be a decent pairing for a matchup for Hammer if that went on. Um, so I... I Quite frankly, look forward to that opportunity to see those two take one-on-one one -on -one in the ring. I think that's another big boy for Hammer to go against. I think the other thing we also got to look to, too, is it wasn't that long ago where uh, Cesar Duran was handing some sort of a box or an opportunity to Mil Mertes, uh, King Mertes, actually, um, and got to wonder if this isn't leading somewhere there as well, too. What does Cesar Duran have in store for him, or is he part of a big picture for going after Alexander Hammerstone down the line as well, too? Um, this was better for Hammerstone than the Richard Holiday promos that he's been doing as of late, which, don't worry, we'll get back to some more of that later on in this program. But at this point in time, this attack wasn't a bad idea, especially for what uh, they needed for Hammer at this point. 
Okay, yeah, you're kind of explaining some of this to me right now because I, I was confused by this segment and I think it's partially because I haven't watched very much Lucha Underground and I don't know who Montanza Duran is. They haven't really explained who it is on this show. I know it's supposed to be Caesar Duran's brother, but he hasn't had matches and, and then they did a swerve at War Chamber where he came out, but it was actually Jeff Cobb under the mask and... So now, uh, was this Jeff Cobb supposed to be under the mask here? No, obviously not, because they would have showed it. But I'm just confused by this whole thing. So I feel, for me, it's a little bit clumsy feeling. I don't know why he's attacking Hammerstone. I don't know why this unknown guy who hasn't had matches here yet would have a little program with the World Heavyweight Champion. It, granted, not a title shot or a match in the ring, but even just interacting him with him backstage, this is confusing to me because it hasn't been set up, but uh, uh, maybe this will become more clear. You explained it a bit better right now, but when I was watching this, I was a little confused by this spot. Yeah, and I don't blame you because I did question it a bit at first too, and then again, of course, with between what the commentators were saying and my knowledge of Lucha Underground and how it unfolded, it started to make a little bit of sense. Again, I don't know if it was the correct thing to do. It was better for Hammerstone at the same time. I think may have even been more effective if Matanza Duran had not been in the War Chamber match and revealed as Jeff Cobb and just been brought out as Matanza Duran and maybe just done a flat-out attack on Alexander Hammerstone backstage with no knowledge of who he is at the time, or at least people alluding to, wait a second, that's the monster Matanza, the brother of Cesar Duran or whatever. He's brought him in here to take out Alexander Hammerstone. I think something simpler like that would have been more effective. I think here it seems like they are trying to play on the fact that a lot of the fans watching MLW have some sort of knowledge of Lucha Underground. Uh, so I think they're really grasping at straws there as well too because not everybody clearly has watched both programs and I even myself as much as I know about Lucha Underground I did lose interest after about season two of Lucha Underground after it got a little bit crazy and ridiculous I might have even got a little into season three but I was very much aware of Matanza Duran's appearance uh, Matanza Cueto's appearance at the time in Lucha Underground and what uh, Cesar had for him he was basically there to eliminate the top guys and basically bring the gold back to Cesar's side. So I think that's the direction they're going with this. Uh, we'll see how it unfolds with time and whether or not, again, do you continue to push Matanza as Matanza Duran or do you just play him off as Jeff Cobb and he's the sidekick to uh, Cesar? I, I honestly think I wouldn't have a problem with it being just plain old Jeff Cobb because god damn it I like Jeff Cobb a lot and was looking forward to seeing him more in MLW but again we'll see how this unfolds and where it goes for sure uh, from there hey why not 5150 time for another promo from the boys of 5150 talking about their match tonight uh, this one's uh, very heavy on the whole they were told all their lives that this wasn't for them this wasn't you know, people that looked like them or talked like them were not supposed to be top guys. They're not supposed to be champs. They're not supposed to have good things coming their way. But damn it, they make you believe that it's going to happen here tonight with this promo pop smokes. Oh, I'm loving it. And 5150 always doing their promos in the garage, you know, with the with the graffiti on the walls and the background and the low lighting and they're they're walking around and they're they're pacing around and working up energy amongst themselves i love these segments we had one in the previous show too and these guys are gangster as fuck and they really like I, i'm gonna swear just like they're now swearing <laughs> yeah. unabashedly on this show all of a sudden so uh yeah this was really good stuff and and they're keeping it real too. They're saying like, "Hey, we just got here and and we're asking for a title shot. We didn't really think we'd get one, but it looks like we're just gonna take one, kind of, and uh, and uh, we're gonna jump the line and all that stuff." And then they uh, they were saying we got no option to fail because we have nothing else. We've never had anything. And then uh, Slice Boogie said, "These belts stand for everything we never had," and it. it it's it's good it it it's emotionally uh uh hard hitting because you think of uh the the way these guys are presenting themselves like they never had anything they come from a poor background they're used to hustling and fighting the whole time 
These guys uh, represent the gang 5150, a ruthless uh, street gang from California. They're t they're taking their name from, and uh, not, they're really just selling that all the way. It sounds like they're actually uh, uh, living up to some of the same uh, standards that those guys in the gangs would, and they talk like gang guys. They're they're intimidating. They're awesome, and uh, I love the way these promos are done in the darkly lit garage. It, it's very, very cool. Yeah, it really is. I'm loving it. Great job. Uh, from there, another, uh, I guess, promo or backstage segment. It's Alicia uh, Alicia Toot doing the MLW. I believe the show's called Exposed, if I'm not mistaken, or something along those lines. Uh, we saw this exact uh, incarnation at uh, Fightland. Now being done here, it almost seems like They've divided up what uh, Emilio Sparks and Alicia Toot are doing in their roles. But Alicia Toot doing this program here, uh, doing the uh, Where is Contra? This is the first follow-up we've really had talking about Contra unit since uh, the events of War Chamber. So Alicia Toot gives us a quick rundown of things, saying that Mods Kruger recently been seen in the fighting pits of South Africa, or South America, I believe she said. Uh, Kiro Kwan has fully denounced Contra unit has been spotted in Japan training with the MLW middleweight champion Tajiri and there has been no sighting and no anything from Jacob Fatu the former champion and also Joseph Sam Samael has been completely quiet and elusive ever since the happenings of War Chamber so a quick update at least on Mods Kruger and Akira Kwan there sounds like uh, after all this Contra definitely has been expanded there will be no more Contra but the question remains uh, is Joseph Samael going to come back at the side of Jacob Fatu or is he full on going to be in the side of Mods Kruger uh, what is going to happen between Mods Kruger and Jacob Fatu when they finally cross paths again yeah and what a a whole bunch of questions with no answers and this whole thing's making me so nervous because that was the first thing that I uh, latched onto when I started watching N MLW was what an awesome main event heel faction they have here in Contra Unit with uh, Samael and Fatu at the head and then all their hired soldiers after that from Gotch and Davari to, uh, to Kruger and Quan. I mean there's such a an overriding force throughout MLW since the time I've been watching it at the very least in the last three years or so so I I just feel nervous that that contra unit might be finished I, maybe they're uh, maybe they're uh, getting me here on this and uh, and maybe they uh, want me to believe that and I am but uh, I, I certainly hope not because what a great run it was Maybe they want to split the guys up and do something different. I don't know, but uh, one question that that uh, Alicia brought up that I thought was really good is she asked, has Duran destroyed Contra with whispers and words? And that again calls to the, the backstage manipulations that are going on. He He's like a puppet master of some kind, Caesar Duran. He's got everybody in their little spot and he's working them all separately towards some uh, overriding goal of his too and it's kind of fascinating to think about what he what he's trying to do here or if he's just mixing up the pot a little bit but um, he's really got his fingers in a lot of different pies right now and uh, the this is one the main angle on MLW that uh, has really got my mind working a lot is is about contra units and i'd hate to see the end of it but a you know I, at the same time they had a pretty long and successful and really dominant run too so maybe that's it for them i don't know but uh i really hope that jacob fatu and joseph samuel stay in this company i mean they're just two of the, of the top talents or the two top talents in this company for sure and uh I also like uh, the other guys in the squad as well, and you can have some of the lower members in Contra come and go a little bit, uh, you, you know, as as the lower guys do. But um, I, I'm worried about this. I want Contra to continue, but I'll understand if it's finished too. They had one hell of a run. They really did. But uh, this was a nice piece, good uh, little take. I was uh, happy to see they kind of mentioned them because it hasn't been really mentioned a whole lot. Uh, but from there, we go back to in-ring action. And, uh, man, we've been talking about this uh, for quite some time. <laughs> Finally time to unfold the debut of Enzo. Uh, first, they introduce Matt Cross, his opponent. 
And I'm thinking to myself, is this guy going to come out in any way, shape, or form like the Enzo of WWE? What kind of Enzo are we going to get? So the music hits. Enzo comes marching out. He doesn't seem like a smiley, energetic Enzo. He's got some serious shit-kicking look on his face when he comes out there. He does a bit of a, almost like a boxing type thing where he's swinging the arms back and forth. He comes out to that ring. I, I mean, I half expected to get a promo from him at first. No promo, straight into the ring ready for a matchup. I loved how this crowd in Philly was completely mixed on him. Half of them are cheering for this guy. Half of them holding up signs saying, how you doing? And then other ones booing the living hell out of him. One sign even saying, of all the free agents in the world, and we're stuck with Enzo. I laughed at this. This is <laughs> this is great heat for him right off the hop before he's even stepped in the ring for the first time in MLW. Then from there, I was thinking to myself, what are we going to see from Enzo inside the actual ring? Working with a guy, the experience of Matt Cross, uh, has his game changed ever since the last time I saw him in a wrestling ring? And the answer is yes. I saw a lot more wrestling from Enzo. I really thought this match was better than I expected it to be overall. I thought Enzo's work as a heel was a nice touch in this thing. Matt Cross can put on a great match, and I think that he did a great job of working this one here with Enzo. And the finish, this one got me. I liked this finish a lot, Papa Smokes, when Enzo grabs that ring apron and he's holding on for dear life as he's being pulled to the center of the ring by Matt Cross, pulls it back so incredibly far that the referee is actually going to take a long time to scoot the apron back to the outside of the ring. And I knew it was coming at this point in time. As soon as this happened, Enzo gets up. Dick Kick City right on Matt Cross, sends him down to the mat, and then ends up rolling him up for the pin. This match, way better than I expected. Enzo pulling all sorts of great heat in this one. Pump Smokes, I'm going to let you take the reins. What do you think of Enzo's debut? Sure, sure. I, I was also looking forward to it. Enzo is one of those guys that, that people wouldn't expect me to like, but I do kind of like him. Um, I expected some mic work, but obviously that's Enzo's bread and butter. He was so entertaining on the mic, uh, whether you loved him or hated him, he did got the job done. I had the f uh, fortune uh, of seeing him live at one of those WWE shows a couple years ago. I had was he was new to me because I don't watch WWE. I was loving it, man. It was hilarious. Anyway, none of that kind of stuff. He came out. Looking serious, not assing around with the fans, not interacting, not the stuff you expect him to do. Uh, like you said, he had the serious look on his face, came in, started the match, and was this was just a wrestling match. There was no real shenanigans in this uh, by Enzo. He had kind of a wacky outfit on, and he still has his beard and fuzzy hair and everything, but... Uh, his style is, is is not very complex. There's very, he does simple moves, headlocks, body slams, suplexes, kicks into the ropes, that kind of thing, like head butts. Nothing uh, too uh, complex in the least. You notice his forehead got opened up by that one yeah. head butt too. Yeah. Eh? I think that was a shoot there, uh, an accidental shoot. Um cross at one point mocked enzo's dance that he used to do yeah. in wwe that was a bit funny and it, i think that was one of those psychological things that was that the uh commentators were playing up to a little bit they were saying that i don't think he's going to be too enzo's going to be too popular in the locker room here and apparently he isn't so it, this was uh, matt cross also carrying that narrative by showing some uh, mockery and some bad feelings towards Enzo. And yeah, the kick and the groin and then the eat defeat and uh, the pinfall, that that was pretty nice. And uh, the, that, I just remember one spot, sorry to cut you off, Pop no, Smokes, no. but what a beautiful bump that Enzo ended up taking when he went up to the top ropes and he's coming off of the top rope and Matt Cross goes for the drop kick. Again, Matt Cross has to do his part brilliantly, which we know Matt Cross can do, but I was actually very impressed with how sharp the bump was from Enzo and how perfectly taken from an off-the-top rope maneuver like that, so perfectly timed that that move itself sold so well in this matchup. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that completely. And so we, I, it was an interesting debut for Enzo, making him look... Uh, serious at the very beginning and for his first match he goes over for his debut which is a good idea 
And then I was thinking, well, he's really going to cut a promo here now and talk about how excellent he is. Instead, he didn't leave yet, but they had Casey Navarro coming out to the commentary desk to do commentary for the next match. And Enzo jumps him and gives him a razor's edge into the ring post, which looked like a serious bump. Wow, you could hear that. And then the camera was right on Navarro's face. You could see the the real pain, uh, uh, lines of pain through his face. Here's how you know how effective this was, Papa Smoke. So we're watching this at uh, Castle Munson. And uh, the wife is watching this one with me. And she felt bad for Casey Navarro thinking that Enzo legitimately took this guy's head and rammed it straight through that post. She had me rewind this scene two different times to rewatch it because she swore up and down that this kid actually just got his head slammed right into that ring post because Navarro did an excellent job of selling it and that bump was sick as hell. That was so good. No, oh, that's always the the best measure of anything is to have a non-wrestling fan uh, pop for something like that. That 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 means it was a good spot. So thumbs up to Enzo. I don't know what they're going to do with him in the future. I I can't imagine them keeping him off the mic for much longer because yeah that's really his strong point but uh, this match was good they put him over it was a good debut he won by cheating and that's uh, that's totally uh, up Enzo's alley so uh, good stuff and uh, Matt Cross a perfect opponent for him too a guy that can basically work any match with anybody yeah not only that uh, kudos to Matt Cross with all his experience being willing to go out there put on a great performance with Enzo and even putting Enzo over and you know it just speaks to the wonders of Matt Cross as a human being and as a pro inside the professional wrestling ring uh kudos to both these guys great segment and kudos to Navarro on his selling fantastic uh from there we had a bit of a downer with another comedy segment from Richard Holiday uh backstage with Alicia Toot I mean this one could have been a little bit funny he tries to say that we don't celebrate Christmas in Canada he's really on a kick of uh knocking Canada quite a bit lately so that uh, daddy's boy can go fuck himself quite personally but anyways <laughs> he gets uh, Alicia one of his dynastic coffee mugs and uh, she's just kind of mocking him for this this seems like a terrible Christmas gift idea and then the fight that apparently hasn't stopped in all this period of time between Duran and Hammer goes from being something that could have been interesting to something that's complete and utter dog shit because it comes in here and Hammer has long enough to look at Holiday, take the cup, smash it over the head of Matanza, and this one cup smash, this one stupid little coffee cup takes this monster out long enough for these two to ass off in a promo backstage again with each other. Please MLW. I like these two guys. In fact, I like all three of these guys that were there. Don't ask them off anymore. It is unnecessary and is getting to the point of complete ridiculousness. Holiday put him in a goddamn match for once. He has been out of the ring since War Chamber and just doing these assing off backstage segments. It's time this guy got back in a wrestling ring. Yeah, I agree. We, we've been discussing it over the past couple of episodes. These These... Comedy skits in the back just aren't really going over, partially because they're not funny, but partially because I think you and I as MLW fans want and expect more from from good stars and good talents and top guys like Holiday and Hammerstone. So, yeah, and not to mention that smashing that coffee cup over the monster Montaza's head now makes him look weak. Like, how, how are we supposed to believe a chair shot or a table shot or a pile driver or anything wouldn't just destroy this guy after this, right? So, I have in my notes here, apparently this is funny. I I didn't enjoy it, and I, let's just move on from this. I hope the MLW moves on from this, too. I hope so, too. Uh, from there, we got the backstage segment that you <clears throat> alluded to earlier with uh, Holodead, Aries, and uh, Dr. Dax with the briefcase full of money. Uh, Emilio Sparks is trying to interview them, find out what they're going to use the money towards. At this point, 5150 interrupts, and they've got uh, 
bunch of weapons with them. They're ready for this Philly street fight that's coming up in our main event. What I really liked is the throwback to an earlier promo in this segment. Right towards the end of this particular promo, they actually look down at Emilio Sparks' brand new sneakers and start talking about his new kicks that he's got on. Yeah. And anybody who's been following close enough knows the first time that he followed this group outstage and one of the first times we had Emilio Sparks' involvement in MLW, he actually had his sneakers to take it away from him by the members of 5150. And what I thought was quite a hilarious little segment, a uh, comedy that works type segment. And here, the throwback to it and the the feeling that they were going to go do it again. But then they said maybe they'll get back to it after they're done winning their championship titles. I liked this. It was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I thought they were just going to take that briefcase from the from uh, Hall of Dead and the guys there and I think they had every intention of doing it, except that they were on their way to the ring for the Philly street fight with the shopping cart full of weapons. So uh, they they had enough uh, business on their plate at that time. Yeah, you bet. So uh, from there, yeah, it's main event time. The tag team titles are on the line. It's Los Parks defending against 5150 in the Philly street fight. Again, I'm thinking to myself, please don't let this turn out to be like the last time these two encountered in some sort of no cut rule, multi-man nonsense this just the last time was not good and it's a shame because i like both teams in this case this was not that this as much as we get tired of some of these these gimmick matches and stuff like that and there was some spots that you know it gets to be a bit much uh, i would be splitting hairs if i said that that it was too much in this one it would be nitpicky at that point because i love the overall match i love both these teams i thought it was great i think the only thing that kind of made me scratch my head a little bit in this one was when L.A. Park Jr. goes under the ring. L.A. Park comes out to do that spot where it's, oh my god, it's the same guy, but it's not. Here's the part that made me scratch my head. It's a no disqualification match. There was no need for them to actually do this. L.A. Park at any point in time could have come out and been a factor in this matchup, but nonetheless, again, I'm splitting hairs. I thought the overall action in this one was much better much sharper from both teams i like what i saw slice boogie is a goddamn champion and even though they they walked away as tag champs slice boogie is a guy i see in a main event position down the line he's a big boy he can work he can talk i like his look i think they got something in slice boogie and anybody who signs this guy and brings him over for matchups has something in slice boogie this guy is the future of pro wrestling yeah, I, I that's so right too. And I I saw Slice Boogie o- online, just in the last year or something, and uh, I I ended up watching a, one of his matches, and I thought, geez, this guy might be good somewhere else. Or he he didn't look as good at that time as he does now. But at any rate, I, I had him in the back of my mind, and I'm so glad to see him uh, getting a bigger platform now, and and on and on a show I watch too. But uh, this. Uh, this main event was set up pretty nicely here. 5150 came out and grabbed the mics and addressed the Philly crowd a little bit. Kind of got the crowd pumped up for the thing. So uh, working as baby faces in this match then a little bit. Uh, had them chanting 5150 and a few other things. So okay, we got uh, the heels that you love kind of, right? And uh, and uh yeah, this started as a brawl. Uh, Hijo del, uh, El Hijo started the chair action on Rivera. A couple of good shots there. There was a rake involved, which got hit over Slice Boogie's back. Then the shopping cart of weapons got brought up by Julius Smokes. Uh, the They fought on the floor for quite a bit. There was uh, quite a few of the uh, trading of forearm spots, which I'm not all that fond of but it's very popular in today's matches uh the yeah the la park senior comes out from under the ring hits that spear and rolls out which yeah like you say i i don't know if they're trying to fool the ref in that or if trying to fool 5150 i think it's a good spot in a match that in a regular match where you can trick the referee a little bit but yeah this is this is one of their uh this is one of their spots that they like to do, so they're going to do it. And I'm always glad when uh, Senior gets some action, too. It's amazing how long that guy's wrestled. But yeah. anyway, 
yeah, if there's going to be a third member of Lost Parks coming out, then now we got Homicide coming down to ringside for for 5150. Uh, reaches under the ring, pulls L.A. Park Sr. out and fights off with him. So now we, we got that eliminated from this match. Now the crowd's getting really hot. They're chanting for tables. We didn't, it wasn't exactly a table, but it was a flat piece of wood like a table that got put in the corner. El Hijo uh, de Parca got speared through the table and then a top rope foot stomp combination slam finisher pinfall new champions 51-50 we, yeah, we like you said we saw this match before it was it was a mess it was it was it was completely unorganized and a kind of a real mess to watch this one now they tightened it up quite a lot polished it quite a lot this was very enjoyable to me um, this was the kind of match you probably had to have between these two teams because they're both basically quite heelish both tremendous uh, uh, rule breakers as well so uh, why not have it as a no disqualification match here a street fight and uh, put the titles up on the line and uh we got new champs now, and this is kind of exciting. I don't uh, know if Lost Parks is, is going to be still kicking around MLW. I haven't heard that they're not, but uh, we got the brand new guys in 5150 champs. So, Munson, who do we have breathing down there next? First of all, we are, our next big show set of shows is going to be from Dallas. So, will the Von Ericks get a shot that fast? That should be interesting. I believe it's actually been signed already, Papa Smokes. I think they even mentioned it on this episode that nice. uh, the Von Ericks would be getting their title shot in Dallas against whoever ended up winning. So it looks like we will be seeing the Von Ericks versus 5150 in Dallas, te Dallas, Texas. Man, this has the bakings of a real classic between those two teams. I think so too. I think this match could have a lot of heat to it. 5150 has put themselves over or got themselves over tremendously already since they've been here. I, their heels, or they're very heelish, but the fans like them because they're cool. And I feel exactly the same way. The guys are cool, and I like watching them. Even though they're a dastardly tag team that's very violent, out there to hurt people, out there to cheat and get wins any way they can, but you can't help but like them. And when they're allied with good uh, uh, guys like Conan... Guys like Homicide, guys like Dr. Julius Smokes. It's a colorful team, and they're a unit, and they're a whole faction based around this tag team. And I, I like what they got going on, and I like that they're going to be a perfect foil for the squeaky clean Von Erich boys who are tough as nails and are tag team specialists also. Don't ever wrestle uh, singles matches, just tag team all the way. We got a big clash coming up in Dallas, and I can't wait. This is going to be great. Well, and even before MLW gets to Dallas, we know that they just had their tapings down in Mexico as well, too. So we're going to get MLW Presents <clears throat> Azteca Underground on MLW Fusion coming up in the coming weeks. I'm very much looking forward to seeing MLW Go International with some of these. We've been seeing the tapings from Philly for quite some time now, and it's great. We've gotten used to the Philly crowd. A lot of the uh, fans of the crowd even becoming uh, recognizable at this point after you see them week after week. And uh, yeah, so it'd be nice to actually see something a little bit different, go to a different uh, place and not just going to a different place in the United States, going with the international blend, heading on down to Mexico and seeing how the Mexican crowds react to the MLW uh, wrestlers and then coming back they got Dallas Texas on the line and we've seen Court Bauer sending out lots of messages about where people would like to see MLW go next and I did reach out and say that as much as I'd love to see them come to our neck of the woods in Saskatoon I think if they were to come to Canada that wouldn't be as feasible unless they were doing a whole tour here but hey I would not be opposed to and Court Bauer please listen in go to somewhere like Calgary or Edmonton because or you know what for that matter Winnipeg uh, that is very close quarters for myself and Papa Smokes, and we would love, we'd love to attend the matches. But better yet, Court Bauer, if there was any opportunity, any at all, for you to add a commentary team temporarily for the Canadian <laughs> version of MLW, please, sir, please allow for just one time for the Video Bros, even just one match on your show. I'm begging you, the Video Bros would appreciate and love the opportunity to call. 
an MLW match based here in Canada. Papa Smokes, I, I couldn't think of anything more awesome if we were ever given that opportunity. Well, for sure. And if it's broadcast in Canada, they would need us as commentators because Canadians can only understand Canadian accents like we have. So it's it's a match made in heaven. It truly is. And so hopefully that will get to happen or we get to see MLW tour in the world and come to our neck of the woods somewhere uh, within Canada. I would love to, if nothing else, be a part of the MLW audience live in attendance. I think it would be a hell of a time. So looking forward to this, seeing all these different stadiums, all these different opportunities for MLW moving forward. Seems like they got a lot going on. We know that coming up, I believe this week, uh, as we we're recording on a Tuesday, I believe tomorrow night, we finally get to see the MLW Middleweight Championship defended since Tajiri first won it. Uh, Tajiri going to be defending, and I, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the gentleman's name right now. But another wrestler from All Japan, this one actually took place at an All Japan wrestling show. So they are actually going to be showing us that matchup on MLW Fusion. Great to bring in that international flavor. And that's, I think, one thing that Tajiri has helped to do, open that door with All Japan Pro Wrestling. And going to see a lot more of the All Japan Pro Wrestling uh, wrestlers make their way to MLW. Uh, this is fantastic. I'm looking forward to it. Again, we love that international flavor. And again... Overall, it's been three solid episodes in a back to back here for MLW, as always, giving us great free wrestling action. Uh, but unless you got anything else, Papa Smokes, I think that's all I've got for the MLW shows here tonight. Uh, so we're going to wrap things up. This has been a fantastic episode of Ring Respect Radio. And if you're still with us at this point in time, thank you for the longevity and the good ears that you provide us each and every time we do one of these episodes of Ring Respect Radio. Uh, again, once again, we ask you, if you haven't done so already, to hit the subscribe button down below and tell your friends about Ring Respect Radio. Let them know about the show. Help to boost us up on, uh, on not only on our channel, but on Mike the Ref's channel, Backbreaker Media, and all over the podcasting world as we get our voices out there and get heard more and more. We really appreciate everything you guys do for us out there. So once again, from myself and Papa Smokes, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Take care. When you go to the old saloon at the dead south end, Gonna find you a man there wants to be your friend If you dare to deny his wish you'll be dead by dawn So give him a drink and a smile and then move right on Rednecks with white faces Don't go put no down Rednecks with white faces Don't you dare to smile as long black